Good afternoon, good night, wherever you are, uh, to the 12th session of the speaker series on the um, um, response uh, to the COVID crisis. This is the Cities on the Frontline series organized by the Global Resilient Cities Network and the World Bank. Today, we're very happy to um, have two very renowned speakers who are, go are going to share with us one of the most um, fascinating cases in Latin America of unlocking uh, a city. Uh, we're going to be addressing how Bogota, the capital city of Colombia, has uh, faced the coronavirus um, pandemic and uh, how their policy has been adjusted and their public um, uh, administration has reacted to um, the, the virus. So I'm very happy today to be joined by two speakers. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Maurice uh, Kugler. He is professor of public policy at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Professor Kugler uh, is um, a researcher that has specialized himself in labor markets and human capital, and he was particularly the head um, uh, research editor for the flagship United Nations uh, Human Development Report. Um, he will be uh, talking today um, on the conceptual frameworks of how unlocking a city uh, is done. Uh, welcome, Professor Kogler. It's a pl pleasure to have you with us today. Um, we're also going to be joined by Dr. Juan Mauricio Ramirez. Uh, Dr. Ramirez, he is currently the Secretary of Finance of the City Government of Bogota, Colombia. Um, Dr. Ramirez is a, uh, an economist and he will be um, presenting today the policy design and implementation of Bogosa City. So without further ado, I would love to um, give the floor to Professor Kugler, who will share with us his experience as a researcher on the conceptual framework of unlocking Bogota. Dr. Kugler, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So it is a um, great uh, pleasure uh, to be part of this uh, exciting series. Um, these are very difficult times around the world with the pandemic. Um, but the, in terms of the silver lining, one of the stimulating things is to see the exchange of ideas on a global basis. And this is a great example of how uh, people concerned about policy are uh, trying to jointly uh, find solutions and ways to think about the challenges that uh, generate synergies around uh, the globe. And uh, in terms of uh, exit strategies from uh, COVID-19 lockdowns uh, at the city level, um, I'm delighted to, to be uh, sharing this platform uh, with Juan Mauricio Ramirez, uh, who is like myself an economist, but we have a broad perspective that we hope uh, will be useful to uh, enhance our understanding of the ways that one can uh, tackle the policy challenges. So um, I will start with this, a discussion of the conceptual frameworks, and then um, it will be extremely interesting to hear the uh, experience of Bogota in terms of uh, how uh, some of these challenges have been met and what are the lessons learned in terms of what works best. Um, as we all know, uh, as COVID-19 has spread uh, on a global basis, uh, diverse coping strategies have emerged across cities in the global south and uh, indeed across countries. Uh, it is uh, well known that cities are hotspots for contagion outbreaks, uh, naturally due to uh, population density and economic agglomeration. So, it is especially challenging to uh, take early measures in the urban context. And uh, I have to say, in, in the case of uh, Bogota, with the leadership of the mayor, uh, uh, Claudia Lopez, 
Uh, Bogota has been a beacon of light in Colombia in terms of leading the way of what decisive early policies uh, needed to be implemented. And I have to say also on the front of uh, policy innovation, it's been very important. So this is uh, a graph of the evolution in uh, five different uh, countries of um, the, I'll show you the animation of, of the, um, okay, of the, uh, the way in which the daily uh, fatalities have evolved over time. So we see uh, the, the very diverse paths which reflect both the different contexts and realities faced by each country, but also the different policies uh, for trying to achieve a flattening of the curve, including social distancing and others. And we can see that uh, in general, the pattern is uh, relatively similar. Uh, what is really uh, remarkable is that only con one country as such has managed to uh, flatten the curve in this case, uh, namely uh, uh, Germany. So let me go back to the presentation and uh, start uh, discussing more in earnest um, what uh, the situation is in uh, cities around the globe. And specifically, I want to talk about the challenges for uh, cities in uh, developing countries. Uh, so with the evidence that uh, there were uh, contagion spikes, uh, many countries were in a position where uh, a quarantine needed to be implemented uh, to avoid severe uh, crisis in terms of intensive care units uh, in urban areas. Uh, so this led to uh, uh, an emphasis, and uh, I have to say that's the right emphasis, on saving uh, lives. At the same time, the lockdown had very uh, strong effects in economic terms, um, especially for uh, poor households, um, for a number of reasons that I'll explain in a minute. And with the business shutdowns uh, and the uh, lack of employment, there was a huge crisis in terms of poverty and inequality being fueled by the lack of opportunities to generate in income to cover basic needs. Uh, so let me now go to um, the the actual um, dynamics of the uh, virus diffusion. So there is the the um, concept we are all familiar with, R not, which is the number of people that are expected to become contagious once one person uh, contracts the virus. Um, so ideally, to do an exit strategy, you are in a point where R not is already less than one, but that's not always the case because the pressures from economic reality lead people to ask for uh, an early change. So um, the plan to reopen ideally would continue to limit the human life health costs uh, and allow economic reopening so that we have an actual exit strategy that involves a continuing of the flattening of the curve. Um, the challenges to face out the lockdown uh, will be presented, options to flatten the curve and trade-offs involved, and then uh, Juan Mauricio will uh, connect this to the experience in Bogota, which is, of course, uh, very rich and uh, very uh, fascinating. Um, so, um, I'll start with multiple challenges. Uh, one has been uh, the lack of preparedness. Uh, so uh, 
Unfortunately, after the SARS epidemic, uh, there were a number of uh, agreements around the way the World Health Organization would operate that were not completely met. And this has met, meant that the, there has been uh, limited uh, readiness in terms of both the, the supplies uh, at the medical level and the coordination uh, in terms of finding a solution and working towards a va vaccine. Um, in some cases, the reaction has been very fast. Uh, for example, when uh, the city of Wuhan in the province of Hubei in China was closed at the outset of the outbreak, and that averted a bigger tragedy in the case of China, but of course the virus did spread outside the confines of uh, China. So um, that's a, a challenge. The other challenge, uh, number three, is exacerbated inequality. So the, the problem is that the costs and benefits of lockdowns are very unevenly distributed. Uh, there is more vulnerability for poor households, and um, this is a, a big problem. Uh, and we'll explain why the uh, inequality has exacerbated and uh, what are some of the aspects that impinge on uh, the, uh, how uh, more uh, precariously prepared households are dealing with the, the situation. So, one of the issues is fiscal space limitations. Um, in developing countries, uh, it is much harder to find resources to be able to uh, help the most needy households. And uh, this is a challenge that I think in the case of Bogota has been met very um, um, creatively and, and with a lot of innovation and I, I think Juan Mauricio will provide a, a very um, uh, good account of what has been done uh, in Bogota. Um, I'll talk more now about the social safety net precariousness, um, which has to do with the fact, well, first, that uh, social protection is not as well developed in uh, developing countries because of the fiscal um, pressure that that, that imposes. Um, and that's not a good state of affairs. I'm not trying to justify it or explain it. I'm just uh, stating it as a matter of fact. Uh, but the other aspect is uh, informal sector workers, um, which in the case of Colombia and, and uh, uh, Bogota more specifically, uh, comprise uh, at least half of the workforce, if not more, and they do not have social safety net protection. Um, and of course, the the big issue in terms of um, what happens to poor households is related to the digital divide. Um, not everyone has the same degree of access to the internet and to telecommunications. And depending on the sector and the occupation, telework might not be an option. So while some people uh, or households or workers are able to continue um, uh, receiving an income, others have no such option. So now I'll move on uh, and talk more specifically with the general background about the exit strategies from the lockdown uh, of course, uh, given the diversity of experiences with the uh, diffusion of the virus across countries that I just shared with you, uh, we have to emphasize that one size does not fit all. Uh, and I will share uh, six uh, possible exit strategies. Some of them are extremely costly and may not be relevant uh, in the short run. And uh, others um, might be more uh, feasible from a fiscal stance, but might be um, relatively ineffective. So the scenario one, the benchmark is to have a lockdown until vaccine. But uh, of course, that's not 
uh, doable in most countries because it would imply uh, that the lockdown extends for another 12 months or perhaps even more. Economically, that would be too costly. Um, poor people wouldn't be able to um, a, be quarantined for such a long time, such a prolonged period. So, um, number two is a phase out of measures, uh, which is gradual. Um, number three is adaptive triggering, um, which is not, um, it's being proposed uh, by researchers at the Imperial College in the United Kingdom, but it's not very effective in the sense that it yields um, a situation in which you may have um, uh, prolonged uh, an agony. So uh, basically what happens is that you have the worst of both worlds because you open um, the economy as soon as there is a decline in the rate of new cases. And then when it gets worse, you have to quarantine again. And then this cycle would make the overall time of lockdown much longer. Uh, scenario number four is permits, but those have uh, also been uh, uh, thought to be um, uh, not so effective. The, the issue is that with antibody testing, um, it would give people like a certification which allows them to work. Um, but the problem is that um, you may have um, a behavioral response in terms of people perhaps trying to uh, get um, the virus intentionally in order to be able to get the antibody test that gives them the work permit. And uh, this would be particularly true in the case of developing countries where a large share of population and, and in large cities, um, people are desperate to get out to work. Um, so it could be counterproductive. Um, the scenario five is the biweekly testing. Uh, this involves a massive screening, but the, it, the requirements are very high. Um, there are some people in the US who are recommending that this is done, but it's not clear that uh, it would be doable on a national basis or even a citywide basis in, in a lot of cases. Now, for example, it's been done in Wuhan because there has been a, a new outbreak and every citizen, every uh, person living in Wuhan is being tested. So. Uh, the last one is uh, contact tracing, which of course has been um, uh, tried in, in different contexts, including in, in, in Singapore, and we'll talk a bit about that. So phasing out the lockdown gradually, uh, that's where you implement uh, sequential measures uh, to try to get, uh, here we have on the vertical axis uh, R0, you're trying to get it below one because that's the point at which uh, you start uh, uh, totally flattening the curve because you have less infected people for each new infected people. So eventually um, there is a vanishing um, of the number of uh, infected individuals. So the contact tracing regime could, in principle, get us to R0 less than one, uh, meaning that each new person who is infected is uh, not infecting as many people. Remember, with R0 um, uh, at 2.5, which is where we were at the beginning, the rate of contagion of uh, COVID-19 was extremely high. Then it was reduced with self-isolation, school closures, and social distancing. And then uh, if you were able to uh, put in place an app-based uh, contact tracing with uh, testing on demand for our not less than one, um, you would uh, uh, be able to get a faster uh, transition. But uh, as you can see here, the contact tracing 
is very um, involved. Uh, I think the technological challenge of developing the app that is installed in the um, phones of citizens is uh, it's doable, you know, it's, it's not an unsurmountable challenge. But uh, where the problems come is when uh, you try to convince the population to have an app on their handheld uh, device that allows uh, the government or some agency to track their coordinates 24-7. Uh, um, and people have, a, a, you know, reservations about that, but this, this would show, you know, like how people can be tracked who are going from home to the train and then to work and then back home. And the second day, you know, there is an event that is reported by the individual and all the people who have been uh, in contact with that person who resulted to have positive COVID-19 uh, will be uh, notified and they have to take uh, the right measures of self-isolation for 14 days. So here um, are the exotic strategy trade-offs between uh, fatalities and loss percentage of GDP uh, for a year, a 12 month period, starting in uh, March 2020 and in March 2021. Um, and basically, uh, we have uh, the six strategies traced out. Of course, uh, lockdown until vaccine is the way to minimize fatalities, but it also uh, has the heaviest economic cost. Um, and uh, so on. So um, uh, I, here, uh, I would say, you know, like there is uh, no escaping the fact that both the health costs, so the aspect of uh, saving lives uh, has been uh, very challenging, and also the aspect of uh, economic costs of saving livelihoods has been very challenging. So these are the trade-offs in terms of what different cities and different countries face. Um, but uh, you know the, the issue is that this is a really, really tough uh, policy challenge and uh, choices need to be made. Um, uh, you know, in this context, you know, like one can, I wrote, uh, for example, um, some um, op-eds with some researchers in India where we found that for the case of India, a potential combination of uh, gradual easing off with contact tracing, uh, so a technology solution combined with uh, uh, a smart reopening of the economy uh, could work because we saw that by weekly testing, uh, which is number five here, would be uh, undoable given the cost in the case of India. So let me uh, close uh, my remarks and then um, uh, open up for uh, Juan Mauricio to, to continue and share with us the, the experience in Bogota. So uh, the one of the good things has been the international learning about what works and what may not uh, work. We have uh, different experiences in Germany, South Korea with massive testing, contact tracing in Japan and Singapore, and geographic segmentation of social distancing in China. Um, so the, the aspect that is very salient is that just reopening without an exit strategy is very risky because the probability of a new outbreak with a spike in contagion uh, can be high. Um, so basically to stop the lockdown without an alternative strategy to flatten the curve, <clears throat> it's a big problem. Um, an optimal exit path must involve saving lives and also saving livelihoods. 
Uh, so you cannot just like take them as alternative approaches. They complement each other and um, it would be counterproductive to reopen the economy without a clear exit strategy that involves a new way of continuing to flatten the curve. Uh, so in terms of the medium term, um, we need um, reforms to create more formal employment. Uh, there is a strategy advanced by the World Bank called Jobs and Economic Transportation, uh, Transformation, which is the JET strategy. Um, and the key of formal jobs is that they have higher wages, higher benefits, and are more stable. So uh, for cities, this is very important. And uh, uh, to, to end, I want to highlight that during the lockdown and ongoing gradual reopening of the economy, it's been instrumental, for example, in the case of Bogota, to find uh, innovative ways to distribute aid, to stagger work schedules, and to optimize public transport uh, to make social distancing uh, possible. So thank you very much. And I um, yield to um, my colleague. Um, yes, to my colleague, um, Juan Mauricio. I'll stop sharing now. OK, thank you very much. Let me. Uh, uh, Maurice? Yes, I can hear you. It's Francis. I'm, I'm, uh, first, I'd like to apologize for technical difficulties and testing that this, my sound works. And then I would like to remind all the participants that they can ask a question in the Q&A section of uh, the WebEx. If you move your mouse on the screen, you will see that uh, there's a dot, dot, dot. If you click on this, you can access the Q&A section. So thank you very much for asking your question in that section. Juan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure for me to be here in the coronavirus uh, speaker series. Uh, I'm going to share. OK, so I'm going to, to talk about the case of uh, Bogota. Uh, what ha have we done in terms of uh, mitigation and what is our exit strategy from lockdown? So first, just a few numbers about Bogota. Bogota is an agglomeration of about uh, 9 million inhabitants with a density uh, larger than 4,000 uh, uh, inhabitants per square kilometer. A GDP is a, is a, is a high uh, medium uh, uh, income city. 25%, it represents 25% of the GDP of Colombia with a, a poverty ratio of 12%, uh, more or less between 30 and 35% of the population are vulnerable and uh, an inform informality ratio in terms of employment of 42%. Uh, this is like a, the timeline of the last uh, two months, say, from the first case first confirmed case in March the 6th, uh, almost 10 days after that, in a, a, a couple of weeks after that, on March the 20th, started a lockdown drill in Bogota before the national lockdown begins. In that term, in that uh, sense, Bogota started before the, the country and it was a, like a reference case, I, I guess. For, for, for the whole country. So we started the lockdown drill, a very strict lockdown at that time. And, uh, yeah, and it has been from, from that, okay, and in March 25th, uh, they started the national lockdowns uh, that allow 34 essential activities to be in, 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 in place. Uh, and at, until the end of that month in April, and after 26th of April, 24 activities are allowed, including construction and manufacturing. And uh, at the beginning of this month, 
46 activities were allowed, including some industry and trade. Uh, an important thing and an, an important measure that the policy that took Bogota was the eco economic support package for poor and vulnerable households that began very early in this uh, timeline, uh, specifically in, in, the, in March 29th. I, in, it, it, deems, it, it, it means that uh, almost one week after, after the uh, lockdown, this uh, special mitigation policy that I'm going to, to show you uh, started uh, mainly through monetary transfers. Uh, it has to say that uh, in order to adapt to the national guidelines of uh, uh, partial uh, activities that were able to operate, we, it, it, they were des uh, designing some biosecurity guidelines and forms that are put in place for gradual reopening. Firms have to apply to that uh, uh, forms, have to fill the forms and have, for example, to specify uh, how the, the workers are going to travel uh, to the place of workers, as I'm going to, to show you. This is the, the average movement of citizens from information, uh, uh, from cell phones, and it, it showed that, that, that the uh, lockdown was very strict and, and, and very successful from the beginning. The uh, uh, successive uh, stages has been uh, a little more uh, open, and it has uh, uh, reflected in the movement of the of citizens. But we are still uh, very low, uh, uh, very below from from the normal uh, level that you should have before all this started. Uh, so how do we ease off? There are like, a, I would say, three criteria. First, and a health criteria, uh, a mobility criteria, and also an economic criteria. The health criteria uh, has uh, several uh, indicators. I'm not going to specify any or uh, every of them, but to emphasize the fifth one, which is the to use this indicator like a very, very important indicator of uh, the occupancy, occupancy rate of the uh, uh, intensive care units to uh, the treatment of uh, uh, COVID-19 cases. The idea is to monitor every day what has been the use of this capacity and allow up to 70% of the occupation rate Otherwise, we think that we're going to be in trouble uh, uh, in terms of the capacity of the, of the health system to attend these cases. The second is the mobility criteria. In Bogota, 80% of uh, the population uh, uses public transportation uh, uh, somehow to, to move from households to, to, to their places uh, to work. So the use of the, of the of a party of a private car, the particular uh, transportation, is relatively uh, low. So so it's a, there is a very a danger of uh, of uh, contamination of uh, contagion because of uh, in public transportation. So because of that, uh, and the other very important indicator is the occupancy rate for public transportation. And the idea is that it shouldn't be larger than 35% in any of the hours. Of course, specifically at, at the peak hours of the of the traffic. Uh, we uh, the idea is to avoid passenger crowding, and this has been uh, in order this to work. The the open up of activities have been uh, uh, assigned different time schedules for, for, for working. For example, there is no uh, possibility of construction uh, activities to start before 10 a.m. 
So there is no any 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 public work in, with transport in, in construction uh, at that time before that time in order to avoid, of course, the peak of transportation by the public system. That's very important. Uh, the new activities, for example, that are, are uh, planned to start in June the 1st should be uh, uh, start from 12, from noon to, to 12 p.m. Uh, so we are trying to, to, to extend the, the, the schedules of uh, uh, economic activities to, towards a city of 24 hours, seven days, a day uh, working city or, or uh, activity city in, in, the, in the city. The other is the economic criteria. The first of, of them is, of course, how to pro provide economic relief to poor and vulnerable households in order for them to stay at home. Otherwise, we are going to have many people trying to get their life uh, in, 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 in the streets. Uh, there is also some geographic approach uh, in which we trace uh, traveling in areas with a high number of infections, uh, as, as I will show you uh, in a while. This is the transportation demand to see how it has worked. Uh, the blue line is the 35% occupancy ratio. And you have seen that uh, we are from the beginning of the of the lockdown. We have been below, well below that ratio, that ratio. And uh, um, all, all, although since middle April, transport demand has been increasing steadily. In some parts, because of this, has like a main routes, but we have also these uh, neighborhood routes. In some part of the neighborhood routes. We are a, a use of uh, transportation demand that are almost uh, close to this 35% occupancy ratio. So this is a. I mean, I, 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 I'm trying to say that this is not like a, a homogeneous situation. You, we can have more or, more or less a good indication, look a good indicator in the main routes, but some problems in some, some neighborhoods, specifically in, in neighborhoods which are very dense populated and uh, with important number of uh, households in poverty and vulnerable households. Uh, and this is the other key indicator, the uh, uh, intensive care units occupation rate. It has been increasing, it was, uh, around 30 percent for uh, for most of the time, but now it's 45 percent, and we are still looking at that. Of course, the, the health system is working to to be in in to to expand this capacity in order to get more more ability to move in with the lockdown exit strategy. Um, Okay, and this is, I think, that one of the best uh, practices that we have uh, developed in Bogota, the economic support for poor and vulnerable households. We target 350,000 poor and 400,000 uh, vulnerable households, more or less representing 2.5 million people living there. And uh, the idea, the basic idea, of this is to start in the with a very intensive use of uh, databases on poverty and vulnerability. You have there uh, the the which is called this is when is this is the database of uh, potential beneficiaries of uh, social programs, and uh, we can identify in that uh, system of identification of uh, this database, the, these poor and, and vulnerable uh, uh, households. We also have some other sectoral lists, so to speak, like street vendors, artists, victims, recyclers, uh, transvestite, ethnic population. Uh, and we, 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 we cross with the, with the, the, the CISVEN uh, database in order to be 
in order to see if they are there in conditions of, of, of uh, poverty or vulnerability. And we have also a window of new beneficiaries, uh, which is no, not the, 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 the databases are imperfect, even though the last one that has been for is, uh, is from uh, last year, the last couple of years, even though some of the, of, of the, of the, of the households are not there, the poor households are not there. So, so we need a window of new beneficiaries to get, a, say, uh, some indicators that show us that there are a situation of poverty in order to, to add to this uh, to, uh, database. But it's not a database that is increased by demand. We are, we are, we are trying to get this, this uh, 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 crossing from, from, from lists. Now, an important thing is that uh, we have three instruments, cash transfers, cash vouchers, and support in species. Uh, like markets or food stuff for, for, for specific households. So people that are integrated into, into this database, they, are, uh, they receive cash transfers. People that are not in, in, the, in this database, but, but are in, 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 in some necessity, I mean, I mean it, that we need to, to respond in the short term uh, we, we use more the other, the, the third channel, the support in species and also cash voucher, vouchers to, to get those population uh, attended. So we have this individual targeting and I am talking up to now to individual targeting, uh, uh, but also uh, we have geographic targeting. In some parts, we have, for example, uh, the, the the map of uh, poverty by streets. Uh, so, so in in the case of the 100 more uh, poorest uh, uh, villages of uh, or neighborhoods of Bogota, we go there and uh, try to attend them immediately. Not not not. I mean, we need to to react uh, uh, very fast. So this is an example of the of the increase in the household of uh, uh, beneficiaries in the number of household beneficiaries from 600,000 more or less to in uh, at the end of, of March 29 of March to 335,000 in uh, March uh, in May the 13th. So in less than uh, uh, one month and a half. Uh, one and a half month, we were able to put uh, uh, in function a system that didn't exist before in Bogota, because Bogota didn't have uh, a monetary transfer before. So this was in a couple of weeks, we had to set this. And I think that it has been very important. And I have to, to say at this point, that uh, the, 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 the national government started something similar, which is called Colombia Solidaria. The program in Bogota is called Bogota Solidaria in Casa. Uh, and uh, together with the, the, the transfer from the monetary transfer from the government, this, um, this number of households grows from 30, 33, 5, 30, 300 or 350 to 500. 50, which are the uh, 550 or 500,000 uh, households attended, which is what we have, we are right now. Uh, and this is a, an, an interesting uh, uh, map comparing the spatial density of transfer in the left-hand side to the map of uh, uh, multi-dimensional poverty in the right-hand side. And you can see that we have been very successful implementing this system and getting into the 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 the, 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 the neighborhoods that are in, in 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 poverty situation. One key element uh, for this, and I forgot to 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 refer to that, is the role of bancarization. The to get and and, and in fact I I I, I uh, go back one 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 for a second. 
in, in fact, we could start at the beginning a very, uh, uh, say, a very fast uh, pace because we were getting into into households that were already uh, a, a subject of transfer transfers, uh, um, uh, conditional cash transfer from the national government. Uh, they were bankerized. They were. Uh, uh, they had uh, banking services, but at the end, and this is why this uh, 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 decreasing rate of progress is explained because the for first the households are more difficult. Uh, uh, it's more difficult to, to to locate them first, and second, we need to incorporate them in the database and to bankerize them in order to get the transfer, the, 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 the monetary transfer or the, or the other transfer. Uh, okay, so this is the testing part of the, of the strategy. I would say that we are, we, we have to improve much more in this, in this part. Uh, the tests are being uh, prioritized to those who showed symptoms related to COVID and are, of course, the citizens treating hospitals and who show symptoms, 100% of them are, are now testing. And also we have these special care zones. This is an, an, an strategy that has been in place from the, like in the last uh, two weeks. And those are some, some specific uh, uh, areas in which there are more uh, presence of uh, people with uh, infected people. So in those areas, the, 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 there is a compulsory face mask, face mask use, otherwise fines are imposed. There are a reduced number of activities, uh, of economic activities are allowed. There are constant supervision, there's a constant supervision to avoid overcrowding. Uh, uh, Etc. Some there are street disinfection operations also, and uh, there is a double effort, set, so to speak, to trace chains of of uh, spread. So, just to to end and to 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 go to your questions, observations, uh, just uh, what have been done now? Are, where are we going? I I use the specified three these 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 points. First, special social mitigation is a key issue. It's a absolutely key. The strategy to guarantee a minimum income for poor and vulnerable households is very important. Uh, we the 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 challenge is now to reach 100 percent of poor households and vulnerable population, even if they are not in the, the databases. We have to search for them and to get them into the database, to get them into the, the, the bankerization. For a strategy, exit strategy from lockdown, I think that we are in scenario two, easy of gradually of the scenario two that Maurice was talking about. Following strict biosecurity controls, sectoral reopening with stagger shifts, we are, as, as I said before, uh, uh, trying to get Bogota becoming a 24 hour, seven day city. Uh, question is, and is a really key question, if we are going to scenario three, adaptive triggering, or to scenario six, contact tracing and testing, and there is no, 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 no doubt, no doubt that the response cannot be the scenario three. Scenario three is really the worst, uh, as uh, Mauricio, uh, Maurice was, was showing. There is also the importance, I, I didn't talk about those tools, but very important the, 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 to have tools for monitoring evolution of these key indicators and citizens' perception. We have surveys that are applied to citizens, to households, to see how they feel, how they react, how if, if they are uh, understanding the messages, if they are understanding yeah, and, and there are interesting interesting changes that are taking place that the, the uh, uh, policymakers we need to take into account in order to be more effective. And finally, of course, and uh, given that I am the Secretary of, of uh, Finance, the fiscal strategy 
and the coordination which national government is essential. Last point there is Bogota is, is, is maybe a, a very, with, with two or three more uh, big large cities, is in the possibility of increasing it, uh, its depth in, in a substantial way to, in order to, to uh, overcome this situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Juan Mauricio. Very, very, very interesting. And especially um, it lands on what Dr. Kugler was presenting as a conceptual framework and gives very precise and concrete examples of how this can work or not work in a city like uh, like Bogota. So we have uh, uh, questions. Um, before I go to, to some of them, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm sorry that I did not do it at the beginning of the session for the audience and the speakers. My name is Eugene Zapata. I am the Managing Director for Latin America and the Caribbean uh, for the Global Resilient Cities Network. Thank you all. Uh, we have a, an interesting question uh, coming from uh, Jacob in the audience. Uh, it's about uh, measures uh, for migrants. Uh, we know that uh, Colombia and Bogota in particular has had a strong uh, influx of uh, migrants in recent times, not only from the rural areas of Colombia, but also from uh, neighboring Venezuela. So the question uh, points to, uh, is the city um, uh, implementing particular measures for migrants or daily wage population that are coming from the rural villages? Okay, that, that's an important and complicated question. Complicated because the immigration problem is a national problem uh, from, from our brothers of Venezuela. Uh, and, and so, so they and, and and yes, Bogota has a very, very good social services in terms of uh, ability to to provide services for the population. However, in this case, we understood that it has to be a, a, a an strategy that mainly has to focus on the national government. So we speak with national government, saying in that way. The which this didn't, didn't it didn't means that we didn't do nothing. We started to support in uh, to to provide support in specie, not cash transfers, uh, not cash vouchers, but the other the third channel say to this population. But the main strategy in front of of uh, the uh, uh, immigrants have been in 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 the hands of the national government. Thank you, uh, Juan. Maybe one last quick question, since we're getting uh, close to the end of this uh, of this speaker series. In your analysis, you separate uh, poor households from vulnerable households. Could you unpack why you you made this decision, and uh, what are the reasons behind this division, and uh, and how you how you did it? You say, it's, I, I didn't understand quite, uh, uh, Francis, you say about the difference between poor and, and vulnerable households? Yes. Okay. The thing is, I mean, before this start, I said to you, the Bogota was, has like a 12, 10, 12% uh, of, of, of poor power, of poor households. But there are a large population of, of informal uh, workers. and. Some of the of those informal workers are in in those uh, uh, poor population, poor households, but some of them are not. In fact, uh, uh, the, the the a large part of the population uh, was uh, uh, exiting from poverty in the last 15 years, as in many uh, places in Latin America, and going into not not still a, a middle income. Uh, 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 household, but in this part of vulnerability. So that population was very vulnerable to this shock because they were informal uh, sellers, uh, uh, street sellers, for example, they uh, street vendors, and so so we 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 started started from poor, and then started to 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 going up. Increasing the uh, say the attention to 
households that are very close to poverty, but not poor, not poor in, in that sense, but very close that because they were probably now in poverty. They are probably now in poverty. So, so that's, that, that's uh, uh, the main reason we started to do that. Thank you very much, uh, Juan. Uh, we are getting to the close of today's cities on the front line. So I want to extend a huge thanks to Maurice and Juan for talk, taking the time to join us and sharing uh, their reflection on how to gradually open our cities in a safe and efficient manner. I think it was extremely interesting. Since I could not do it uh, at the beginning, I want to remind everyone that the speaker series are off the records conversation. And we ask that you not attribute any comments made today or question asked to the speakers unless their materials are made available after the call or uh, you have the person's express permission to do so. Uh, the material will, uh, as always, be posted online so you can go uh, and look at the details. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Next week, we will discuss waste management issues related to uh, the COVID-19 crisis with Dr. Gemma Jam from University of Georgia and Lakshmi Narayanan from Pune again. I wish you all an excellent day if you're in the West and an, e an excellent evening if you're in the East. See you next week. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Eugene and Maurice. Thank Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.